Okay, let's go ahead, take it away, and to the analyst desk we go, DJ. Uh, we got our first matchup of the night. It's going to be a hype one. Yeah, absolutely is going to be massive for both the league and the games. Uh, as a whole, we've got Akuma Glaives going up against Glaive Amethyst. These are the two teams at the top of the standings and, and pretty you know, new team uh, in the form of Akuma Glaives coming into the league this year. But they did make a very bold statement at the start that they would be at the very least a top four team. And we may be seeing the start of a brand new rivalry here in heavy league. Yeah, I mean, these two teams are supposed to go at each other's throats, ready to duke it out for the throne. So right at the top, I want to get your thoughts on where we want to look or who's going to be able to climb that uh, sort of mountain the fastest. Where are our eyeballs going to be drawn for game one and game two? Just hit me with the deets. I want to see your thoughts on, on where we're going. Yeah, I think where we should keep our eyes on is, is the top lane to start in these matches. We've talked a little bit about Giga. We saw him play on stream uh, starting off in his first games last week. And we've heard from Juicebox guy about Kronk. Uh, I believe Kronk, Kronk, Zonk in that top lane. Uh, very aggressive player. I think those are that is a matchup that could snowball very heavily, particularly if that Rumble is selected again uh, for Akuma Glaives. It's it's a champion that needs to get ahead in the early game, that needs to have very good ultimates around objectives. And so if that doesn't get played around properly, uh, things could get very, very spicy. The junglers also like to play on that top side. So I think that is a place to keep our eyes on, particularly for draft number one. Yeah, I always got to look for those team fighting compositions when things like that rumble are drafted. I mean, you always have to look for those big, heavy, objective oriented team fights. And in the same end here uh, for the top lane for Giga. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can look at here. He likes to play the Renekton, that dominating top lane style uh, champion. You pair that up with something like a Nidalee in the jungle, and it's going to be absolutely amazing. And as we get ready for draft here, DJ, um, I'm curious to what these teams are going to be able to do when it comes to outdrafting the opponents. Glaive Amethyst looking to take away a Shen, Renekton, and Pantheon. Akuma Glaive's going to ban away Camille, Seraphine, and Olaf. And we're going to get the Cowboy himself uh, on the desk. Graves in for a Glaive Amethyst. Yeah, man, we talked about the top lane and Glaive Amethyst making it come true. Three potential top lane bans coming out from them to take away Giga's champion pool, but very quick pick ban coming in as the Kindred gonna be locked in alongside the Kai'Sa to match up with this Graves. Yeah, a Kindred and Kai'Sa, two extremely sharp AD carries, each ready to carry the game in their own respect. Uh, Kindred can, of course, make that front to back play style happen. Kai'Sa always gonna be able to dive the back line and ooh, make that an wow. pick that is my champion my bread and butter every day of the week and we're gonna grab that one in for game number one right. it's mr 200 years yeah it is and i would hope to see a thresh here at the very least something defensive to pair with Aphelios. you've heard it from basically every uh high elo 80 carry that this is a champion that needs some sort of help completely immobile uh doesn't usually take gale force uh, and so we'll be very vulnerable, but not going to go for that Thresh Arglaive Amethyst. Instead, going to lock in the Nico. That is a support mid flex, but we'll mostly, uh, most likely, excuse me, end up in that mid lane. Yeah, and uh, Nico support has been on tilter at least for a little bit. So I, I fully expect this one to go mid, uh, and I think you are absolutely right about that. So I expect the Thresh ban away here from Akuma Glaives. It has been a popular pick with the Ophelius. That Dark Passage, of course, provides him a lot of safety or at least more than he's supposed to have naturally built into his kit. And there you go. It is immediately taken away. Oriana is going to be the R3 pick here for Akuma Glaives, getting that safe blind pick in the mid lane. And I really like that safe blind pick on the Oriana. If they think that is a Nico mid, it's an easy pick for them. Matches up well with that Nico will scale extremely well into the late game. It's something that uh, I know either Fluke or Levi Ackerman, whoever is starting here tonight for Glaives, is extremely comfortable on. So uh, very nice end of the round, 4-2. And I love the Thresh ban. We talked about it. If there is an Aphelios on the other side, you want to get on top of him. You want to take him down as quickly as possible. Don't let him get to that 200 years capacity when he is in a team fights. And the best way to do that, jump right on him. And if he has no defensive supports, a lot easier to do so. Yeah, and there's a little bit of thought here from Akuma Glaives that this Nico could be going support. They have banned away the Syndra, so at least they're trying to force it into mid, if not just thinking that it's going to outright 
uh, be put in that support category. The last ban is in. It's going to be Akali for Grave Amethyst. They don't want that flex uh, between uh, the two lanes. But of course, Orianna has been played support before. Um, maybe not in this league, but uh, certainly has been an option. But they're going to take that one away from the top laner here of Akuma Glaives. And now the final rotations of picks coming in. I want to see a front line here for Akuma Glaives. Something in the top lane that provides security and safety. Uh, I'm not sure the lane dominance is the answer. It is a Braum. About as secure and safe of the champion as you can get. Yep, very secure, very safe. Will pair well with the Kindred for the defensive responsibility. They have a lot of damage in their comp already. I think you know this makes sense, although might be lacking just a little bit of engage uh, when it comes to this composition. We'll see what the last selection is, but uh, you know Kaisa usually wants to be picked into a diving composition. Kindred's someone who wants to kind of jump in, but sort of play in either a mid, a middle fight or a fight that comes back to her. But oh, there's some engage coming out with the Rel, and that's something you don't usually see paired with an Aphelios. Yeah, that is. A crazy pick. My initial reaction there is pure honesty because Rel and Aphelios do exact opposite things. Aphelios, kite back. You don't want to get involved. You want to be as far away from the fight as possible. No safety at all to your champion. Rel, she doesn't give a damn about who's hitting her. She gets aftershock. She gets a tankiness based off her kit. She's going all the way in. Galio's there on top of it all. He's going to come in with a hero's entrance when she dives into the comp and pops her stun and gravitum. Uh, pull so a lot of offensive capability here with a pop blossom along with all that engage now Akuma Glaive's gonna round that out again with a frontliner here in top lane picking up that scion yeah that is a scion very tanky composition now and they are gonna have the extra defense with the kindred ulti again the real problem here gonna be engaged for Akuma Glaives. they really have no way to start a fight they're gonna have to kite back they're gonna have to look for a pick you know, Scion, you can just ulti into the enemy team. You're going to survive for a little bit, but it's pretty easy to dodge out on flash, dash, whatever you want. Someone can tank it, and the Galio will certainly be tanky enough to do so. So really no way to kickstart a fight here for Glaives. It looks like they're just going to want to allow this Kindred to try to power farm, give her some protection with priority from their bot and middle lane as they do go up against this composition of Glaive Amethyst, which does look like a very good team fighting composition. You've got the engage on Rel, you've got a little bit of defense uh, for Aphelios with that Galio, which I really like in B5. Um, although, who is gonna be the top laner? It's probably the Nico, right? Yeah, and good thing you mentioned it because it's gonna be Nico top lane, and that's not something that we see too often, unless we're getting some crazy technology here that I have never seen. It's going to be Nico top trying to get that poke in onto the Scion, get him poked out of lane, not allowing the Scion to get to that tanky point as often, uh, as quick as he'd like to. So interesting here to see Nico top. It's something that my top laner plays and something that uh, we've seen a little bit um, out of professional play as well. But Glaive Amethyst going to take this Nico top. We, we said we wanted to look at top lane and now we're getting Nico. So I guess they're delivering. Yeah, and it is going to be very volatile. Haven't seen the Nico in a long time. Of course, we do see Wonder pull it out in the LEC from time to time, trying to pressure a lane and, and should have good pressure. And yeah, as we do see it locked in there, top lane by Kronk Kronk Zong. Uh, will have good pressure into a Zion for sure. It's going to be a tricky lane for Giga. He'll have to farm up effectively, but of course, Zion always going to be useful in the middle parts of the game with those tanky stats will certainly be very, very hard to cut through and is sort of the only go button, as we mentioned, for Akuma Glaives. It's not a reliable one, but it is a go button nonetheless. Um, what I'm really interested with these compositions, Necrox, is how they're going to interact around team fights. You know, we, we talked about the lack of engage for Akuma Glaives. Not a whole lot on the side of Glaive Amethyst either. You can have Galio go in, try to get a taunt with a flash, but he can easily be peeled away by the Scion, pushed away. It's going to be really hard for these teams to pull the trigger. Uh, and looking at who that benefits the most, I, I can't really say I'm sure when the Aphelios wants to kite back, uh, when the Kindred kind of wants to stay in the same place, kite back. It's going to be very interesting to see how team fights are set up. But if I do want to pick out win conditions, I think for Glaives, it has to be the Kindred. You're not going to dive. You're not going to have Kaisa going into the back line trying to assassinate because you don't have any setup. So it has to be the Kindred getting strong. And if you are Glaive Amethyst, you want to try to set up a fight where you can maybe start and then try to kite back for the Aphelios. But I, I feel like it's going to be really awkward for Vark on this Aphelios to operate in this game. 
Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right here. And this is exactly what I want to focus on first into this team fighting, how they're going to sort this out. Because when you pick a champion like Aphelios, he demands you to play around his playstyle. He does absolutely nothing for you if he can't set up his own win conditions. If he doesn't have the right gun combination, if he doesn't have the right positioning in a fight, he's going to do basically nothing. He's going to be a glorified caster minion, uh, to be honest, in these fights. So I think you're right. They're going to have to go in with Rel and then the Pop Blossom Galio combination and then begin to fall back whatever they haven't found off with that initial engage they're gonna have to then sort of peel back for their affilios akuma glaives it's a little bit easier i think they can just front to back they've got braum and scion uh, to do the dirty work for them here on the front line you've got champion like kaisa who can build kraken slayer along with her second skin passive kindred another marksman as well with that execute damage into frontline targets like the rail like the galio and then you've got oriana to provide that safety and if things get a little out of control she can bring everything together with one shockwave. Um, I, I think that's basically how these team fronts are going to play out. My eyes are particularly drawn to bot lane. I think everywhere else is just about set in stone. Of course, junglers always need to look at when we have two carry junglers, how they're going to path. That's more up to Doctor and Juicebox Guy to break that down as the game goes on. But I'm curious your thoughts, Kaisa and Braum versus Aphelios and Rel. I think we're going to get a lot of action here, but I think it might be a little preemptive from Rel. I, I'm not sure how this lane is going to play out. Um, if she gets caught out trying to go in and make a play. Yeah, I don't think Rel wants to go in at all um, in, in this lane, which is very awkward for her. I think she's going to have to play a little a little safer. Going into Braum, I think, uh, against this this duo is a, is a, is a mistake. Um, you're not going to have a ton of follow-up damage right away unless you really pick Kai's out, which I don't think you will. Uh, against Nightstar. The CC follow-up from the Braum stun with the Kaisa will be devastating. I think they win the 2v2 unless there is an item disparity or jungle intervention. So um, it's going to be a, an interesting lane for Rel. We'll see if she tries to roam to mid, maybe influence that, try to help out Graves in the jungle. But I think in, in, in particular for the 2v2 in bot lane will have a very uh, muted effect. Will probably be more useful around the map for Glaive Amethyst. Okay, and bringing it out big picture here for the last time before we send it to our, our casters, DJ. This could be a preview of at least semi-finals here for these teams. I mean, this is a big matchup to win tonight, so uh, thoughts on on who's going to win this one out? Maybe cheeky predictions after draft quickly? Yeah, I'll take a cheeky prediction. So uh, I think I will I will lean Akuma Glaives here on the draft. I think you're right that they'll team fight a little bit better. I think uh, picking an AD carry with an awkward position is is a weird decision from the Glaive Amethyst draft. But uh, again, we, we highlighted top lane and I think there won't be a lot of jungle intervention. But if, if Kronk can get a big lead for himself, really use this Nico and be strong in the mid to late game, I think this could go Glaive Amethyst's way. If it doesn't, if they're not getting big lane leads from themselves, I see this going the way of Akuma Glaives. Okay, win lane, win game for Glaive Amethyst and team fight to victory for Akuma Glaives. Thank you, DJ, and thank you to everyone who helped us set this up tonight. But with that, we will go to a quick delay as we get ready to load up onto Summoner's Drift and we'll be back with Juice Box Guy and Doctor to bring you the cast for the evening. Stick around.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Rift as both Glaive squads prepare to batter one another with all the sharpness that their respective Glaive has to offer. My name is Juicebox Guy. Joining me is Doctor as we get prepared for this banger of a game. Yeah, we're on to the Rift and one of these teams is made out of crystals. The other one is actually cold, hard steel. So we'll have to see how the <laughs> difference in materials is actually going to play out here. I do know that the Akuma Glaive guys were a little disappointed in my faith as of last week. So let's see if they can earn it this week once again, because they definitely put up a good show last week. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but that's that's kind of the story with both these squads. They're known for constantly putting up great performances. They've been rocking it from Risen, from Upsurge to whatever org they decide to peat for. These guys are the triumvirate. And you just got to throw a cascade of other other great orgs in there. But these two topping the charts and Klonk Gronk Zonk versus Giga is a matchup that I was thinking about the second I heard of it. But uh Right now, we got a little shenanigans here on the boss side. Vark and Trivia Boy get introduced to the queue from Toy. They walk away, so they're going to be safe and sound. But I hope that that's just a bit of foreshadowing for the, for the combating to come. Yeah, I'm actually super interested specifically in this bot lane um, because a lot of times we talk about Braum being the anti-tank melee support. Um, and Rel is just new and different and yes we have tradition to you know fall back on she's a melee support it makes sense that you know Brom should be able to win that matchup but Rel has a lot going on with her and look at this hits level yeah. one doesn't even need to wait yeah early engage but a nice word from I do believe it was nice stars gonna help them trade some of that damage back on the trivia boy Bark and trivia boy though I mean this is a stalwart bot lane I do not expect these guys to go easy yeah, and I think because they're going to hit level 2 first, you have to expect Trivia Boy is looking to go in once again. The timing there is a little weird because they were in, you know, slow form. But it, it still works out nicely. And look at this, they get the push advantage. It means that their jungler can be a little bit more finicky and a little bit more aggressive. He is doing the full clear, though, so they're not too worried about that per se. Yeah, the superstar, he is not enjoying his bot laners getting bullied, so he's coming in hot. He'll already use Trivia Boy, jumps out trying to get to safety. Q use onto Trivia Boy from the Braum. Teleport channeling and Vark flashes out at the last second. That is pause in from the mid lane. Taunts it up, goes Superstar, Superstar, about to go down. He's got double buffs, who gets them? Galio is going to end up with both those buffs as another man drops oh, for no. the red squad. And Toy, the lone survivor here on the bottom bottom side it started out so good and it all came crashing down they just lit up akuma just completely pulling the trigger that early you're getting a teleport it's three minutes into the game your mid laners picking up double bluffs killing the carry jungle too right like that's the kindred she needs to get farmed she needs to get kills and marks and all these other things and on top of that because she was bottom side she's losing the first scuttle mark and just kidding uh baby powder uh -oh. my guy <laughs> you've been here the whole time uh, he was just chilling by the river he had kicked up a lawn chair at that point looking looking just spiffy but they get to deny the mark i think that's the big win from all of it and Superstar, I would say maybe playing slightly scared, although a early Graves with Ignite, not someone you want to check into. Yeah, it's incredibly scary. Definitely with the phase rush too, so you can always chase him down. Superstar no longer has that flash, so once you do the hop skip away, you're pretty much a sitting duck. And so Graves, had it been a 1v1, probably would have pushed the envelope a little bit further, but they did have Levy there, who has been an absolute unit in our first series of last week. And uh, look at this. Oh, Can't no. Again. That's tragic. Nightstar pops the flash immediately, and the wave is in such a bad spot for them. Look, I, I could go on and on about the prowess of Vark and Trivia Boy. They're incredible laners. They've been together forever. Uh, but this just feels unfair. They can't walk up it's shooting from a mile away like, oh, yay, I got a melee minion. It's, it's a nightmare. And look at this. Ganked again. 
Yeah, I mean, at this point, why not just pop some shots into the brick wall that is the shield and let them go on their merry way? They have dragon pressure, sure. They have the prio in the mid lane. They can just mosey on over. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a huge boon to Nightstar being... Oh! Superstar taunted up, and here comes the damage. The Q gets uh, most of the damage, but honestly, the second proc will be all they need now. Pause, too. Getting the auto attacks and one more should do it. Levi Ackerman finally getting a little bit of pride for Akuma with the kill in the mid lane. I can't quite call it a solo kill because it was a little jankier than that, but could be traded right back here on the bottom side. The tether is available. I think Toy is just doomed, grabbing him to stun him up, and there was the Inferno to lock him down. Nice star can do nothing. But look at that sweet bald man with the heart shield laying on his chest in recall. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Levy, who's coming in as the second most killingest uh, player in the league so far, mostly just behind Superstar, the jungler, and Levy recognizing that they had the kill on the POS, they had what they needed in damage-wise at this early level, and they got the early flash to make sure that even a counter flash there wasn't safe enough. And then it's a great start to the Orianna, who they talked about on the desk, is a huge factor in this game, can completely change an objective fight with just a single shockwave. You need to get some gold in early, and you're getting it. You're getting kills, you're getting CS advantages because POS has spent so much time out of lane, and if that continues, as long as the rest of the map can get it together, as long as this bot lane of Nightstar and Toy can, you know, stop oh. dying, then there's a <laughs> world that Levy can actually carry this. Absolutely, and Orianna, you know, nothing to scoff at. Getting early kills onto that Orianna can mean a lot of trouble for everybody else. You know, a, a, an area that hasn't been remotely affected by the junglers is that top side, and that's a Pretty solid farm advantage already for the Nico over the Scion. He is chilling, feeling quite happy as I can't believe Superstar is so worried to gank at this point that with Trivia Boy and Bark pushed up, he's just like, nah, I'm a recall. Um, I don't. Oh, they, they did. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if they saw the recall. The timing was very tight when they checked the bush, but they're still going for the dragon regardless, and there's just simply nothing that Akuma can do about it at this point. They need to give it up. They're weaker. They had less people. But this top lane's interesting in a different way because oh. it's something we kind of used to see a lot when, you know, on hit Nico was first popping up in the LEC and across the rest of the world where it was really dominant in these tank matchups because it just keeps building and building and building this split push pressure and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. This time, though, Giga did pick that Scion into it, so either they're aware of what the Nico's going to do, or they're just saying, tank's the best bet. We're just going to outpace you, we're going to out-sustain you, and we're just going to survive until late game. Yeah, and I'm actually a huge fan of the uh, tanks win game strategy. Granted, neither squad really opted into too much of that. Giga's going to be an invaluable asset to the squad as we move later into the game and akuma can get giga tankier and tankier and while there are individuals on the glaives team that can definitely burn through them it's gonna take a while and it, that just gives levi and nightstar uh, plenty of time to set up some of these big team fights that they're going to be looking for to kind of get back into this but at the moment they are over 2,000 gold down and we're only nine minutes into this so that it might just be a pipe dream and it's going to be a while before that reality could even be remotely possible yeah, and we're going to have to see how much of an advantage can continue to grow here for Glaive Amethyst, too. They're up three kills. They have some bonus gold in there. I'm trying to check to see if they have any plates. It looks like they have one in the bottom lane, and they're just, they're just running. That definitely feels super forced on the bottom side. Has the Rift Herald, uh, which I, I guess, you know, Superstar could use that to get a few plates, but honestly, that felt... That reeked of desperation. Yeah, the Kindred has fallen so far behind. Just finished up their last smite ahead of Baby Powder. But to be Ooh. honest... Oh, wow, Vork! 
Oh, the Moonlight Vigil plus a little bit of spicy goodness leads to Vark getting a second kill on the board. Happy Cat is right, Vark. That was sexy. Oh, no. All the chakrams just pinging on through. What can you do? <laughs> like, I thought the heal was going to be enough, and then I just see the dwindling chakrams come flying through, and it's like every time you get away from a play with 4 HP, and then the minion aggro just kills you and it's just so painful to watch oh and so much disrespect the ultimate from kindred has been laid down but baby powder is here the ultimate on to two to follow bark on that killing spree that's gonna feel so so good boss is now in the bot side taunts up two kills one and that is three members dead for the side of akuma and it's just disgustingly brutal doctor break that down for us that was just absolute brutality coming in they had everybody on the right side of the map they had the galio ultimate just keeping vark alive and you said it perfectly disrespect there's no reason to be attempting to go in on that as superstar just simply none you're behind your o2 you have a quill and there's just nothing there to be done and they go for it they think they have enough with the ultimate there to stay alive and potentially get out and then just the rest of the team shows up and the perfect timing as soon as the ultimate ends you get the collateral damage coming in the flash taunt from pos and just there's no reason to be there just give it up <laughs> Okay, Pop Blossom used early, and they need this kill so bad. Clonk flashes out of the main CC, but Superstar able to just pelt him down with those arrows. So finally, some good news for the Akuma squad, plus the Rift Herald drop, which is just going to be a little something extra going towards Ki uh, Giga and Superstar. Baby Powder, though. Baby Power is putting massive buckshot into the wolf lamb combo back over the wall. Go Superstar. He's running for the tower and it looks like he might just be safe. Pause though. Come being up to this top side. He has so much speed. The taunt lands onto Superstar and Superstar could be such bait. Now Baby Powder just needs one more tap. Somebody just needs to uh. pop him a single time and they can't reach him. Giga saving the kindred's life and kindred operation get out stay alive went pretty well yeah pos standing for pain of separation just can't get close enough to get the kill there would have been just enough had the justice punch gone the correct way but man that was such a great play from pos recognizing that they have time to roam they've picked up the you know correct item to continue exactly what they're doing and they're just playing support of galio right now they're not concerned about being the number one fragger on the map they are just looking to benefit the rest of the team vark's going insane uh baby powder insane just support those two and they should be able to carry you to victory here yeah, and why wouldn't you do that? There's no reason to play risky at all, but you can, if you would like to, his toy just takes shot after shot, and even through the shield, he still lost about 200 damage there to Vark. This tower about to be forfeit. Can they keep it alive for one more wave? Yes, they can, but Dragon 2 going over to Glaive Amethyst, and they are looking like the shinier of the two weapons. Yeah, it's, it's looking a little rough for Akuma Glaives. Now, it's not to say they're not out of it yet. Yeah, we talked about their late game scalings and what they can do to it. If they can get a great shockwave as the dragons continue, and all of a sudden you pair that up with a choo-choo train, and then potentially the uh, Kaisa diving into the back lane, there's a lot of damage there, and there's a lot of opportunity to be had. The problem is they need to be timed correctly. And right now, you're kind of looking at just getting stat sticked, right? Like we're seeing that yeah. Glaive Amethyst, they have the items, they have the stats that they have built up to this point. I mean, you can look at it. They have three mythics across the board, whereas we do only see just now the second coming in for Akuma Glaives. Oh, Superstar has to pop the Lambs or Spite incredibly early, and I figured that was what was going to happen. A few other people arrived to the party, and Superstar gets sent home with four deaths. Rift Herald now going over to the side of the uh, of the Glaive Amethyst, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm losing my optimism right now for this Akuma team. 
It is a best of two, though, so it's not completely donezo just yet. They do still have an opportunity to pick up game two, uh, potentially tie up the series. But again, you know, it's. I don't think it's over yet. I think they still have the stardom to be able to do it. I think they have the tools to do it. They're just getting out rotated right now. They need something to slow this game down and give them more time to scale because Glaive right now are just nonstop pedal to the floor. They're not giving any breathing room right now. I mean, look at this. Look where they are. They're at the enemy crud camp because they, they just can be. Like, what, who's going to stop them right now? Nobody. Yeah, you kind of just have to give up whatever they want. It, you, they're like the biggest bullies I've ever seen on the Rift, and Akuma's learning that firsthand. Superstar could be going once more to the gray screen, but he's going to slip out that time. Chunked out horrifically low, and, you know, just take a second to look at that gold differential between the junglers. You have Baby Powder. At 6,600 total gold, he has 2,000 gold in his inventory ready ready to be used. Meanwhile, Kendrick's sitting over here at 5,100. That is about a, a full, like a half an item down, a half a mythic item down right now. And that's not going to be, you know, that's not going to be caught up anytime in the remote future. No, and I mean, if you want to talk about it, they're getting half horizon right now. You know, there's a 50 <laughs> CS difference, and that accumulates a lot of gold. You can point out that the mid lane is the exact opposite situation, Levy having that 50 CS advantage over POS, but look at the items that POS is building. It's got the Shrelias, the Dark Seal, like not exactly these high damage carry items. There's these more supportive items we've already talked about. Whereas Levy right now is the only shining light for Akuma Glaives. They need all the gold. If you could donate just a pile of gold from Superstar to Levy, this game would actually be in a better position. If you, you know, paid your tithe and just made sure that your carry was the one you know benefiting from the economy here we'd be in a different spot yeah you're completely correct kindred is just really really struggling so far and i uh, still sitting at level nine baby powder level 11 i don't mean to keep harking on that but it's just astounding how distant superstar is in the, the uh in the rear view window of baby powder as the mid lane tower it's probably just gonna die here. I mean, Levi can try to defend it. No, they're actually they're gonna play it a little safe here. They decide to peel off and just head towards that third dragon. It is Mountain Soul that's on the table, uh, which, yeah, which is kind of uh, kind of unfortunate <laughs> if you're on the Akuma team. Yeah, they were really going for the kill there onto Nightstar, who had been trying to set up that freeze a little bit. Does let it go. And as we just see a bit of a trade here, Glonk should be safe. Is getting a lot of damage done, though. Yeah, the only reason Glonk didn't turn that and blow up the Kindred was purely because uh, Toy was right behind in the wings. So I don't really, I don't really fault Glonk for not uh, taking that shot because he certainly could have. Meanwhile, that minion in the front at the mid tower plays hero will not be connecting any long range snipes for nice star moonlight vigil though doesn't get anything done but uh I, I like that they're trying so for those of you interested in the mark market kindred currently has two. <laughs> oh my goodness it's 19 minutes into the game we're averaging about a mark every nine and a half minutes Yes, but, uh, superstar, my man, my boy, my friend. It's it's uh, pretty gross. They do have a great situation, though, here. Oh, Vark flashes away from the Shockwave, and now Levi is getting 1v1 by the Galio on the backside of the fight. Trivia Boy playing the front line of the best he can, Pass 2 also standing scary as a stone sentinel can stand. And after what seemed like the best flank possibility they could possibly have, they just have to run away and give up that inner tower and now the inhibitor tower could be under a little bit of the rest yeah i mean the flash from vark just completely ruining the flank there it, it's 
what it's there to do and with that they do lose the tower they don't lose any lives though which is crucial it, it's a bit of a slowdown right if this had been maybe three minutes ago then potentially it is a bloodbath for a glaive amethyst but akuma glaives this time they're a bit tankier they have a bit more stats behind their belts so they do just lose the tower and they have three minutes roughly to get as fed as possible they need just an absolute huge stimulus injection into their gold pockets because in three minutes time we are going to be fighting for this earth soul and it is going to give an unlimited shield to the rest of glaive amethyst for the rest of the game Ah, oh, trivia boy not even waiting for his teammates to get there before he goes for the engage and Toy is left behind like every sad childhood story. Nice star growing up without his support anymore. And Baron is on the table. No smite though for, uh, for Graves. So maybe a possibility of a steal, but it would be almost certain suicide. Yeah, I mean, that's the power of Rel. You can go in that much ahead of the rest of your team and be a thing, right? Like, if you're Ooh. any other... Oh, the damage was massive. Pop Star... Oh, sorry. Pop Blossom goes massive, and Blue Team has secured Baron Nasher now. Trivia Boy and Vark are trying to deal with the big meatball on the backside, but he's just not looking that meaty. Moonlight Vigil and everything thrown at Giga. Giga doesn't have the unstoppable force to get away, but... Oh! Beautiful snipe, but, uh, can't get the stun. So, Baron Nasher... Baron Nasher is secured, but that's gonna be uh, that's gonna be all they're able to secure. Yeah, I mean things are looking pretty good. The Baron does go down over to Glaive Amethyst, and I do believe we are gonna be attempting to get that up on the screen for you guys once again. But yeah, I mean they get the Baron. It was a little dicey there actually because you saw everybody try to kill Superstar all at the same time, and it meant that the bottom. Oh no. Oh, hold that thought as Nightstar is so close to death, and it was so quick, too. Pause 2 standing up here looking real frightening. Middle inner tower getting chunked ever lower, and Superstar can do nothing but give it a two-finger salute as it drops. Check out Nico on that bottom side as the snipe lands, but it is Infernum, so they will not be able to get the stun. They'll just get a ridiculous amount of damage. I believe one proc brought uh, Superstar down to about half health, a little under. That's unfortunate. Uh, and I do want to point out, this actually isn't the on-hit Nico of old. It is full AP Nico, and it, it hurts. Yeah, no, it's, it's mighty painful and a bit of a nuisance to deal with now. Middle inhibitor dropped in a matter of seconds. And when you have five people up at any given moment and you have to give away a, like your, uh, your, your, your structures right in front of your face, I don't think that there's any sadder feeling that you could possibly have. And right now, the Amethyst Glaive Squad, uh, they are looking like a sharpened weapon. Good for hacking, slashing, and a little bit of stabbing. And a... Kuma's rocking with a big stick. Let's look at that again. Yeah, I mean, they do say that uh, crystal weaponry can sometimes be the absolute sharpest out there. Glass, incredibly sharper, and it does seem to be a bit of an all-around oh. engage once again. Paz was a little bit ahead of the rest of his squad. He's still sitting okay, tethered to Trivia Boy at the moment, so gets that extra resistance and while they are clearing out supers in the middle side of the map it is the top lane that pays the price four members versus five and they are still sitting back too afraid to walk forward you are about to get triple in hand. i know that you're looking you know really gloomy here but you gotta try something yeah, I mean, this could actually end up costing Giga their life, but it does look like the rest of the team has swarmed in to cut them off. Oh, Vark. So don't. Vark is massively out of position, but they do not decide to engage on the Vark, and now it is Glaive Amethyst engaging on to the opposing squad. Lamps for Spite's only going to keep you alive for so long as two more are being killed off. Giga's passive, the only thing getting anything done for the Akuma Glaives. Vark and Baby Powder sitting on that front line and leap. Without a single death. 
is just going to hide in the fountain as the Glaive Amethyst Squad cleans this one up. Game one going over to Glaive Amethyst and they are looking like the shiniest weapon on the tool belt. Yeah, Levy Ackerman not able to live up to the namesake in cutting down the seeming titans of Glaive Amethyst. I mean, they absolutely controlled that game from start to finish. And while a lot happened in that game, it all began with that teleport to the bot lane from POS. It completely disrupted the entire flow of the game for Akuma Glaives, and it didn't seem like they could have recovered after losing their junglers double buff that early.